word to wise Grass only greener when it's fertilized Gave them truth in these songs, they prefer the lies That's any beautiful adrift than her purple lies You can't see me, you see me Wondering how I reach more evolutions than Evie And make it look easy what is up, Earth's mightiest subscribers? It's Ernie, Blurred Without Fear. Welcome back to the channel. All right, today's video, we're going to be talking about Hardware, Season 1, Number 1, by Brandon Thomas, Dennis Cowan, Bill Sinkowitz, and Chris Sotomayor. And in this video, I'm going to tell you why this new iteration of Hardware is not going to be anything like the one you remember from 1993, and more importantly, why this mission for hardware, Curtis Metcalf, has become even more personal than ever, and why this time he's changing the game in how he attacks his arch rival, Edwin Alva. We're gonna talk about all this and a lot more right now, but first, if you wanna see more awesome videos like this one, make sure you hit that subscribe button. And if you enjoy the video, I humbly ask that you Hulk smash that like button because it really helps the channel out. All that aside, let's talk about Hardware Season 1, Number 1. Okay, so right off rip, one of the first things you'll probably recognize in this comic is that the way that hardware is set up, the way it differs from the original hardware number one from back in 1993 in terms of how he is introduced to his arch rival, Edwin Alva. Now, to get into that a little bit, I do want to talk a little bit about what is going on in this, just the simple fact that when you read this comic, the first thing anyone who's read the original hardware is going to pick up on is a lot of the uh, analogies and metaphors that were brought up in the original comic in regards to the uh, pet bird that Curtis had as a child and how it would get out of its cage, it would fly into the window, not realizing that it couldn't get beyond its barriers. Basically kind of a metaphor for trying to get through to the other side to seek freedom, to expand yourself beyond your normal horizons. That the freedom that you thought you always had was a lie and that there is true freedom beyond it if you could just only crack the barrier. And another thing we also get, and this is something we don't really get a lot of talk about in the original comic, is Curtis Metcalf's relationship with his father. We see here where a lot of social commentary on the real world today, just like how it is with the Static and uh, Icon and Rocket comics, in this comic is no different. Those things are seeping its way in where we notice that Curtis Metcalf's father even took Curtis to a protest once and he got to witness people standing up for freedom and trying to, you know, fight for a better way, to, to fight for civil rights. And more importantly, why this connects home is because this yet again speaks to the watershed moment in the Milestone Comics universe where an act of civil rights is shattered in the face of police trying to brutalize what was otherwise peaceful protesters, people who were protesting for Black Lives Matter and how an experience experimental compound known as quantum juice, which was laced in the tear gas that was used against said people, how that affected them and turned them, you know, the ones that it didn't kill, into bang babies, which were, you know, uh, another term for metahumans, basically what static is. And how this becomes more personal for Curtis is because not only was this moment that, uh, you know, in civil rights that created this terrible tragedy when the police went off script and started attacking innocent people, what happens here is that Curtis is blamed for this, full stop. He is Basically, this is all laid at his feet. He is the one who is being outed as, as the reason behind everyone dying and those who didn't die coming back with superpowers. Alva Industries, even though it was them who actually created this whole thing in the first place, Curtis is the one who's being blamed. And this is actually what leads to him taking on uh, more of an active role in becoming a superhero. Whereas in the original comic, Hardware basically just knew, Curtis Metcalf himself knew that Edwin Alva was shady. He knew that he was into some very shady dealings and he knew this because he had grown close to Edwin Alva. And no different than in the original series, Edwin Alva is this man who basically collects child prodigies and people he wants to bring into his organization of Alva Industries and for all intents and purposes, take these great young minds who could potentially become his rivals, his enemies in you know, the, the spectrum of you know, technology and industry, he turns them into his own allies 
but he uses them and uses them to the point where basically they're no good to anybody else. And that's kind of what he did with Curtis. He saw promise in Curtis and brought him in, raised and trained him up and basically gave him all the tools he needed to succeed. And now Curtis is beholden to him. And that's basically where it all goes from there. He's got this whole white savior complex as you know, what we have in Edwin Alba. And, and it's no different here in this new series. In the original series, Edwin Alba was very plain about the fact that he and Curtis were not equals. They were not on the same playing field that Curtis will always be beneath him. And this kind of spurned Curtis into doing more digging into what Edwin Alba was actually up to and then learning that he was this whole ass crime boss behind the scenes. Edwin Alba is literally the epitome of white savior. I mean, he literally believes that he created Curtis Metcalf and that had he not intervened in Curtis Metcalf's life, that he would have literally just languished away in some ghetto. That is literally how he views Curtis. He doesn't view him as a human being. He views him as an asset. Not only that, but this is also a very strong commentary on how, especially even in the real world, that if a person, a white person with power, even if they don't have power, but in most cases, when they are in a position of power, if they say that a black person, man, woman, or child, did something wrong, the people who have the power to enforce the law and the rulings in that law are going to take that person's word over a poor black person or even a rich black person of power. If the white person said you did it, then you did it. Everyone is just going to believe it. That is what this is a commentary on here. We see this with all the you know, different cases of Karens and Kins who go out and accuse black people of doing wrong things, calling the police on them just for living normal existences and in not every case but in more cases than not usually the police believing the white person who said the black person did it and even if the police or authorities don't exactly believe the white person they still give that person more of the benefit of the doubt than the black person being accused and that's exactly what's happened to Curtis Metcalf he's not being given the benefit of the doubt because a man a white man in power said he was the culprit and in doing so hiding his own culpability in the very acts that he's accusing Curtis Metcalf of. Now all of that aside, that is still for the most part intact. However, more of the reason behind why Curtis Metcalf is going after Alva leans more towards being framed for what happened during the Big Bang with the quantum juice in that tear gas. Now, in the original comics, Edwin Alva has no clue that Curtis Metcalf is hardware. There's no indication to him whatsoever that this person is someone that he personally knew. And whereas here, this becomes more of a personal vendetta mission between Hardware and Edwin Alva because there are no secrets. Curtis is not hiding. In a way, you know, we always talk about, oh, Black Iron Man. That's kind of what, you know, Hardware is always alluded to as being is Black Iron Man. And while, yes, that is kind of a way to put it, Curtis, and this is actually some information I got from both Brandon Thomas and Dennis Cowan themselves, is that the thing that really separates those two characters is upbringing. Whereas Tony Stark, he grew up with a silver spoon in his mouth. Curtis did not have that luxury and he had to try 10 million times harder than Tony to be great. And that is kind of you know, where things are separate there. Curtis, while yes, he is, <clears throat> quotey fingers, Black Iron Man, he is a much tougher and more, I would even say, um, you know, more aggressive version. Because in this particular sense, yeah, his identity is out there for anyone who wants to know. He's not hiding behind the hardware persona, whereas you know, in the original comics, kind of was. Curtis kept a secret identity in this day and age, uh, and I believe uh, Dennis Cowan himself said, you know, secret identities are kind of a bygone era thing. This is why in uh, you know, the Static comics, Static's parents are fully aware as to who he is, what he can do. There's no way you would be able to hide something like having electricity powers from your parents or your siblings you know, in this day and age, especially when camera phones uh, exist everywhere and you're pretty much being watched at all times. You know, by somebody. Yeah, there's some way, some shape, form, or fashion through social media and other means that you're probably being watched. The same could be said for Curtis Metcalf in this situation. And that's kind of what's going on here. The commentary here is incredibly strong, even going into the very beginning of this, where the police are going after Curtis Metcalf. And I shouldn't have to remind you of the actual horrors of reality 
in the scenario the fact that in any normal real life situation, this man, Curtis Metcalf, if this were not a comic, he would have been shot dead, murdered, regardless of whether or not he possessed high-tech weaponry or not. And this is yet again an empowering moment showing this man, this black man in this suit of armor, high-tech, tricked out with some of the coolest gadgets in the world, and he is able to protect himself from police who bust in on him and have orders to kill him. They're not trying to bring him in peacefully, no matter how much they try and make him think that they actually are. They're going to murder him. Alva is literally throwing everything he can at hardware. And one of the things I like about this is that not only are we seeing in this comic new gadgets, new uh, arsenal that hardware has at his disposal, but we're also seeing callbacks to some of the older gear in tech that he used in the original comics. We see his trademark chain and sickle, his trademark rocket pack. He's got his plasma whip. He's pretty much got everything that you would remember hardware having from back in the day. Only this time, he's got even more of an attitude and a reason behind it to use it. This story has become incredibly personal for hardware, even if it was already a very personal story from the jump in the original series, this one just pushes it even that much further because in this instance with Alva kind of having more knowledge about hardware, you know, Curtis Metcalf as a whole, this raises the stakes and makes this a much more dangerous game for hardware. And what I love about this and that is that hardware is not hiding himself. He is taking this whole thing on full stop. He's not trying to, you know, take half measures with any of this. And one of the really amazing things here, and I know, you know, we're talking about a very personal story here, but one of the things I thought was very interesting is that despite this opening, despite how, uh, you know, tight a narrative this is and how personal the story is going to be, we're actually gonna learn in future issues of Hardware Season 1 that it's not just gonna be relegated to hardware being in just, you know, Dakota City. I've gotten hints and teases from both uh, Brandon Thomas and Dennis Cowan that we're also gonna see Hardware taking his fight against Edwin Alva and his crusade for justice even outside of Dakota and maybe even not exactly on Earth, which is kind of a new fresh take for Hardware because most of Hardware's enemies and his dealings tended to be, for the most part, pretty grounded. Anything that happened in space or, you know, outside of Dakota typically was relegated to Icon and Rocket in their side of things in the Milestone Comics universe. But in this, we're gonna get a much more wider narrative for hardware. And I also like the fact that even though we may not necessarily see these characters down the road, it has been hinted that we will eventually at some point in time, even if it's not in season one, but maybe down the road, we may see characters like uh, Payback, Reprise, or maybe even uh, one of my personal favorite characters from the hardware pantheon of characters in Milestone Media, and that is the character Technique. We may not see them now, but definitely we'll see them in future seasons. It's also been hinted that we're going to see characters like Hardware's love interest, Professor Baraki Young. We don't know when we're going to see this character pull up, but I have been told that we will see this character in season one, and we might even see this character in a very different light than what we originally saw before. Who knows? We don't really know where it's going there. Uh, we also have some really awesome new additions in, uh, by the way, of uh, Hardware's new AI computer that he keeps on his suit. And, uh, you know, where originally I think it was called Doby in this one is actually just called Pop. And it's, I thought it was a really nice touch that they did this deal where, you know, the, the AI speaks to him in the voice and tone of Curtis's father, which I thought was a really nice touch, it made it seem more personal, especially when the AI is talking to him, when he's in a moment of distress and grave danger that Pop is calling him son and telling him you gotta be careful, you gotta watch out. Like it was, it's really cool stuff, really cool stuff. I like, uh, I like where this is going. So far out of the debuts of uh, the different milestone comics thus far, I definitely feel like this particular one, Hardware Season 1, number one, might just be my personal favorite debut of uh, the three that we've gotten, you know, between uh, Static Season 1, number one, Icon and Rocket Season 1, number one, and of course this one being Hardware Season 1, number one. But anyways, that is basically everything you need to know about my thoughts on uh, this first issue and why this new era of hardware differs from the original one, but also has some similarities as well. If you enjoyed this video, Hulk smash that like button and make sure to share this video all over the internet and with all your friends so they'll know how you leveled up your comic book big brain in regards to hardware and the return of milestone media on your way out make sure to hit that subscribe button and let me know what you thought about hardware season one number one keep it plus ultra and sound off in the comments